Welcome everyone. If everyone will please take their seats, we'd like to begin. Good evening everyone. Welcome to Hebrew Union College. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to be standing here in front of you. Uh, my name is Rabbi Jonathan Hecht, and I'm the Dean of the Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Uh, we are here, of course, at the Feld Memorial Lecture, so I, I think it would be appropriate for a, a moment to remember Natalie Feld, who um, is the one who, in her memory, this uh, this memorial lecture is is uh, endowed and uh, it's because of her efforts that we are all here. Uh, Natalie Feld was a lifelong resident of Cincinnati. She was a high school math teacher, a businesswoman, and an investor. She was a dynamic, powerful woman and she had loves, uh, passions for photography, for art, music, literature, her gift to the Library of Cincinnati was uh, one of the largest gifts. I think it is the largest gift in the history of, of our city's library. And uh, she, was a, she was a lover of uh, culture and things and libraries. So it's so, so wonderful to be here, uh, to remember her this way. She also was fascinated by history. She was considered to be her family's historian, and she was intrigued as she went around the world and met people, and she would write long letters to her, her family talking about the people that she met. So she was the kind of person who collected and brought together history, brought together culture, books, music. Um, she was a great supporter of the arts, the opera guild, and uh, the, the, also the music Hall downtown as well. So I think that tonight brings together a number of things that were important to Natalie Feld, and um, that is why I think that this lecture would have been in a particular interest to her. Because what we have here at in the Cloud Library, the collections that we have, we have brought together some of the most important um, pieces of, of Jewish history this library is an extraordinary uh, pearl in this city. Uh, we are, it's not just a collection of books that we have here. A library, in essence, is a repository for culture. And uh, in today's digital age, where everything seems like information is right at our fingertips at, with our phones, uh, computers that we hold in our hands, uh, which are giving us information at the speed of light, but at the same time doesn't tell us what is really important about that information. And that's why we need li libraries to hold on to that, that culture and uh, to, hold, to hold it and preserve it for future generations. And that's why we need experts like Dr. Sarusi, uh, a world expert in ethnomusicologist, recipient of the Israel Prize, uh, Dr. Sarusi is uh, going to be speaking to us tonight, of course, and I read through his CV, which we, of course, could, could read to you, but I think what's even better is this morning I asked Cantor Shore, our uh, Director of Liturgy and Music Arts, to tell me something about Dr. Sarusi, um, and she said to me, Asking me to tell you what Dr. Sarusi means to Jewish music would be like asking a physics major to tell you to tell you what Albert Einstein means to science. And then she said, Dr. Sarusi is a rock star. <laughs> so at the end of the lecture, I'm sure everyone's gonna hold up the uh, their big lighters and uh, you know we'll have we'll we'll ask for an encore. Um, I think that Natalie Feld would have loved tonight's program. It brings together the intersection of music, Cincinnati and its cultural 
collections, Judaism, and of course the Clow Library collections. I know she would love it. They say music is the speech of angels. It brings us close to the infinite and preserving that music that is the work of preserving a piece of heaven itself. So I'd like to introduce the director of our library, uh, Yoram Biton, who's going to come up and introduce uh, our speaker. One small housekeeping detail. There's a Ford Focus with the lights on. Okay, maybe the Ford one. not focused anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be Go happy up. to call AAA for you after. <laughs> Okay, Erev Tov, and thank you for coming this evening for the Feld Memorial Lecture. The Cloud Library is delighted to have Professor Adrian Sorosi here with us tonight. Dr. Sorosi, a professor and the director of the Jewish Music Research Center at the Hebrew University, at the Hebrew University is no stranger to the Cloud Library. Forty years ago, he came with Dr. Israel Adver to Cincinnati to research the Greenbaum collection. He spent many weeks in the library organizing and cataloging the collection. Professor Sarusi wrote numerous books and articles on Jewish music and has unmatched knowledge in this area. Without a doubt, he is the expert in Jewish music. And for that, Professor Sarusi won the prestigious Israel Prize in, two, in 2018, the highest honor for a scholar that is given by the states of Israel. Today, I am I am happy to announce that the Cloud Library website displaying highlights from, for, from our music manuscript collection is now live and you can, there is a computer here if you want to browse <laughs> later. <laughs> This website was only possible due to the path that Professor Sarusi paved to us and is, is the fruit of his research. We are honored to have Professor Sarusi speak to us tonight. The title of, this, of the lecture is Changing the Map of the Jewish Music, the Brainbaum Collection 40 Years After Its Retrieval. Baruch Haba. And, and <laughs> Uh, please silence your phone or turn off your cell phone. You will soon understand that uh, I am deeply moved to be talking to you today. I lecture a lot, I have appeared in many festive occasions, but this is certainly a highlight uh, in my career. So if my voice is shaking a little bit, please bear with me. On a hot and very humid day of early July 1979, I landed in the USA for the first time in my life. My first impression of this country was, believe it or not, the Cincinnati Airport. <laughs> My first home were the dorms at 3101 Clifton, right in the next building. I remember my room. The goal of this first trip, the cataloging of the Birman collection of Jewish music at the Cloud Library. It is then understandable why I'm truly moved to be speaking to you this evening. And now that you know the context, I will just pause. And now that uh, you know the context, you know what the 40 years in the title of the lecture mean. And it is an honor, of course, to be speaking at the Feld Memorial Lecture in memory of the Felds that endowed this lecture. So thank you very much. I want to thank you, the college all these authorities, and particularly Laurel Wolfson, director of the Cloud Library here in Cincinnati, for all her care and all her logistic 
capabilities to put everything together. Zahor, remember, is uh, one of our basic uh, commandments. Therefore, before I plunge into the subject of this presentation, Edward Birnbaum and his collection of Jewish music, I would like to remember the names of two mentors who are not with us and without whom the Birnbaum collection may never have acquired the publicity it has these days. First, Dr. Herbert Cecil Zafran, of less memory, and Israel Adler, Professor Israel Adler of the Hebrew University of Less Memory, too. Dr. Zafran, the Judaica librarian and historian of early Hebrew printing at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati, initiated the project of restoration of the Birnbaum collection and its catalog with the contribution of a substantial grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Dr. Zafran was able to enroll Professor Adler, one of the leading musicologists in the Jewish sphere, as musicological director of the project. Professor Adler was himself a librarian by training as well as a musicologist. He founded the Jewish Music Research Center at the Hebrew University in 1964 an institution I am proud to direct since Professor Adler's retirement. I had the good fortune of being offered by Professor Adler as a very, but very young graduate student to join him and his wife, Michelle, for what it turned to be a long and intensive summer of work. An empty HUC campus and a desolated and, sum and somnolent city of Cincinnati <laughs> were the ideal setting for dedicating our words to that mission. <laughs> Masked with anti-dust masks, we immerse ourselves in the exciting task of opening boxes after boxes from which the Jewish musical past emerged before our eyes, score after score, document after document. We were not alone in this task, not in the summer of 1979 and not in preceding decades. The Hebrew Union College acquired the Birnbaum collection in a purchasing blitz that followed the end of World War I. The college librarian of those days, Adolf Zygmunt Ockel, a fascinating figure and a passionate Spinoza scholar and collector to whom Hannah Arendt, no less, dedicated a touching essay, toured Europe intensively to buy Judaica for the ex rapidly expanding HUC library in Cincinnati. The Birman collection was one of his most precious acquisitions. Once the collection arrived to Cincinnati, there was a need for professionals who had the expertise to deploy this unique musical reservoir into the public sphere by harvesting it into new research. And the college was wise enough and powerful enough at the time to attract perhaps the two giants of Jewish music research of the time who could have delivered the promise. Abraham Tzvi Edelson, who you see here in this picture, and Professor Eric Werner, both European musicologists served as professors at HUC during its peak years. Edelson, who in fact knew Birnbaum and met him in the summer of 1900 in Königsberg, was in fact recruited by the college with the intention of basing his research and teaching on the Birnbaum collection. He was the first professor of Jewish liturgy in this college. And he certainly took advantage of the work of Birnbaum, a man who he never had good things to say. And I quote from the autobiography of Edelson. All I knew was that Birnbaum was the successor of the famous Weintraub in Königsberg. I found him stepped in German music, his voice insignificant, his hazanut 
unappealing and not Jewish. I visited him only a few times. He never instructed me and he never showed me his collection. <laughs> so Idelson arrives here in 1923. The collection was here for one or two years and he finally got to see the collection he couldn't see 23 years before in Königsberg. From the mid-1920s to the mid-1930s, Idelson separated from the collection the most rare and sensational items. He based, he based on these materials several of his most important articles uh, from this period, and um, <coughs> at least three or four of the volumes of his Thesaurus of Oriental Melodies. Professor Eric Werner came later to the college as a sort of successor of Idelson in the late 1930s, escaping Germany in the very last minute. He served at HUC until the mid-1960s, occupying since 1951 the chairmanship of the Institute of Sacred Music, created by HUC in 1948. As Idelson, his predecessor, Werner too used only the materials that suited his hobby of the history of Ashkenazi liturgical music, and eventually appeared in his book, A Voice Still Heard, in 1979, which draws extensively on the Birnbaum uh, collection. Uh, Werner also published the first thorough description of the collection in an article in 1944 at the HUC Annual. Both scholars, Idelson and Werner, had also attempted to create their own catalog of the Birnbaum collection. Their mistake was to overrule the cataloging of the maker of the collection, Edward Birnbaum. This is the article, by the way, by, by Werner. And uh, I will skip this slide just out of time. But it's an uh, appreciation of Werner of the Birnbaum collection. Uh, so, so Birnbaum had in mind a very precise cataloging of himself, and the catalogs are part of the Birnbaum collection, but they were disregarded. The strategic decision of Herbert Zafrin and Israel Adler was to restore the collection as Birnbaum conceived. To carry this mission, a large room with empty bookshelves was provided to us in 1979. This space serves us to put back the sum 1,500 items of the collection in their original order, as they are still now downstairs in this library, by identifying each item following Birnbaum's own precise listings. To achieve such a goal, we counted with the assistance of the Crow Library staff and several rabbinical students. I shall mention only one of them, one of the most committed ones, a young, jovial, and promising librarian <laughs> named David <laughs> Birnbaum. <laughs> David, my dear friend, since then, 40 years, and the staff of the Cloud Library continued to work on the Birnbaum collection for many months and even years, after Professor Adler and I returned to Israel. The entire collection was microfilmed so that we could work, continue to work in Jerusalem. An extensive exchange of letters between Cincinnati and Jerusalem and some short telephone conversations across the ocean ensured the continuity of the process that we started together. By the way, this is why I remember the 45220 zip code <laughs> by memory. It's in my brain all the time. So. When I got your five, 45220 letter, I said, wow. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Remember, this is 1979. No internet, very expensive international phone communications, no digital copies. Everything has to be done still by regular, what we call today, snail mail. Uh, I uh, would also like uh, to mention that uh, we have the report of uh, Dr. Jonathan Rogers, who was another important figure in the handling of the collection. Uh, this is the report to the NEH, I believe, 
so he says that the statistics are the uh, uh, approximate number of items, 250,000. Mm -hmm. I think that what Dr. Roger had in mind was pages, that is to say, page by page. Uh, I don't think the collection has 2,500,000, uh, 250,000 uh, items. Today, as we celebrate the digitization project of the Birnbaum collection, I cherish those pioneer days. However, it is not my purpose tonight to engage in nostalgia, but rather to look forward into what the opening of this collection now in its digital form uh, can do for the research of Jewish music. And in my opinion, uh, what this metamorphosis will have in the future. But meanwhile, I will focus on the 40 years that went from the moment I was here to today that I returned. And following uh, that uh, process, I want to show you some of the advances in Jewish music research that were the result of that visit. Uh, this, uh, 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 all these uh, achievements uh, resituated the field of Jewish music, which at the time in the 70s still was a picturesque reserve of Jewish studies and certainly of mainstream musicology, and it was inhabited mostly by practitioners, by cantors, as a growing, turning it into a growingly mature field in its methods, theoretical argumentation, and historical and ethnographical depth. The clearest achievement deriving directly from the uh, Birnbaum collection uh, in the first stage was the publication of Professor Adler's magnificent 1989 catalog of Hebrew music manuscripts dated before 1840. And this is manuscript number one of the collection, page number one. So this is the first page of the first manuscript that we saw, and is the first page described by Professor Adler in his uh, catalog. This analytical catalog, which is mostly based on the Birnbaum collection, uh, was uh, succeeded by uh, an another description of the collection by another person that I would like to mention here, Professor John Planer from Manchester University in Indiana, uh, who basically what he did was clarify the extremely complex architecture of the Birnbaum collection for those who wanted to capitalize on it. Finally, uh, the Jubilee of the School of Sacred Music celebrated with a major conference in New York in 1998 that was dedicated to the scholarship and musical performance based on the Birnbaum collection. A, mo uh, a uh, display very similar to this one that I invite you to take a look after we finished uh, was put uh, uh, publicly in New York in uh, 1998 uh, for the first time. Uh, Professor Mark Kligman, then a faculty member of the School of Sacred Music, initiated this event, and since then, even he himself has explored materials from the Birman Collection. On a much more personal note, I would like to add that much of my research emanates from the Birman Collection. Allow me to quote my own words in my yet unpublished presentation of the conference of 1998 at HUC New York that was dedicated, as I said, to the Birnbaum collection. And this is a quote of myself. I found my lecture of 20 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> never published. It was supposed to be published, but it was never published. Eventually, I say, the Birnbaum collection not only provided raw materials for my dissertation, for a book, and for several articles, but also inspired me to envision a methodology of research that combined the essential orality of all Sephardic Jewish music. And I was talking about what the Birman collection uh, contribute to Sephardic <coughs> Jewish uh, music, an aspect that nobody expected that would be so fundamental. So this, the collection inspired me to a critical scrutiny of the relevant documentation available in written form, even if meager at first sight. 
This combined approach, which allowed me to treat certain aspects of the historical dimension of the Sephardic oral tradition, is a synthesis akin to the scholarship of the two founders of Jewish music research, Edward Birnbaum, the cautious and pedant 19th century music philologist, and Abraham Zvi Idelson, the visionary and ambitious comparative musicologist of the early 20th century. End of my own quote of 1998. <laughs> Therefore, I shall include now some examples from my work uh, in the remaining of the, my presentation. Let me just for now say that as much as my colleagues and I have done to uncover the Birman collection, much but much more remains. If I may still so, the collection is still in the boxes. And I just saw them now, again, after 40 years, and uh, I'm always just astonished by the quantity and the scope and the beauty of this material. The future of the Birman collection as inspiration for future research, I will address in my very final remarks. A few remarks regarding Birnbaum's uh, biography so that you know about whom we are talking about. Uh, Birnbaum was not only a cantor, he was a composer, and I will play for you one of his pieces. He was an arranger of the music of others. He was, of course, a musicologist. He was a journalist, and he was a teacher. Birnbaum was born in 12 March 1855 in Krakow, Poland. Uh, uh, then, of course, under uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, regime. He studied uh, Hazanut in several places under the most distinguished 19th century uh, figures, particularly Salomon Sulzer in Vienna, uh, Moritz Deutsch in Breslau, and uh, he took some lessons, as far as I understand, with Samuel Nambur in Paris. In, in 1872, I like maps, so I will show you something important in the map. He was appointed deputy cantor of the synagogue, uh, uh, of, of the community in Magdeburg. Two years later, he became chief cantor in Beuten in, Beuten in uh, Upper Silesia. Here, he began to collect printed music and manuscripts, literature, and source materials that became the basis for his research. His critical essay review of uh, Baal Tefillah, a collection of 1,500 Jewish tunes and recitatives by cantor Abraham Baer, first published in 1877 in Sweden, marks the beginning of Birnbaum's writing career. And a lot of his work was simply uh, commentaries and recessions of the works by others that he published in different Jewish newspapers. Uh, in uh, 1879, Birnbaum succeeded the celebrated cantor Hirsch Weintraub as the main cantor of the Jewish community in Königsberg and filled this post for three decades until he passed away in August 8, 1920. So the map is important because the high day of Birnbaum's period was the period of the unification of the German Empire. This was a period of great uh, uh, um, how can I say, uh, uh, great uh, cultural development, this unification, uh, the victory of, over France uh, was extremely exciting, and the Jews of Germany sort of joined in this excitement, and you will see. So basically, the way of Birnbaum is a way from the deep south to the deep north of Europe. And this has to do also with the fact that his Polish background became more and more uh, watered down, and he became a truly Prussian <laughs> person. So he came from down here in Krakow, in Poland, to Magdeburg, to Upper Silesia, and ended up in Königsberg, a town today called Kaliningrad, part of this Russian Federation, at the time the capital of, um, of uh, uh, Eastern Prussia. So, um, I, th I thought that it would be nice also to follow Birnbaum's road, Birnbaum's path north. This is an idea that only came to me uh, while preparing this, um, this paper. 
Uh, Birnbaum uh, not only published uh, his own compositions and commentaries on others, he also published uh, two volumes of liturgical exercises, that is to train the cantors <laughs> you have to go here. No, no, this one, yeah. Sorry. No, this one. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, the liturgical exercises are um, uh, part of his uh, output uh, to, to train uh, cantors. I would like just to move uh, into some examples from the Birnbaum collection. And what is fascinating is that when I came this afternoon and I saw the display, so the same items I thought is worthwhile talking, there are most of them, they are in display right here. So that means that great brains work <laughs> Um, uh, together in, si in, in uh, synchronization. So uh, my first example is the oldest uh, candor, uh, cantor's uh, compendium. Uh, Aaron Baer uh, was uh, uh, born in Bamberg, Bavaria in 1738 and he became a uh, husband uh, for a short time in Paderborn uh, before he was appointed as the first cantor of the great synagogue in the Hohenreuther Gasse in Berlin in 1768. For you to have an idea uh, of synagogues in, in Germany at the time, this amazing uh, sanctuary, you can see the internal. This is where Cantor uh, Bear uh, performed the music that you have in this little manuscript that is right uh, here. Uh, during his long tenure, he died in uh, 1821, he gathered compositions uh, for, um, uh, of all, not only of himself, but also of his contemporary in a large collection that includes 447 uh, melodies. Uh, among these melodies, he included some traditional uh, songs. You can see here uh, how the manuscript uh, looks. Um, and uh, uh, some of the melodies that he wrote down are real traditional Ashkenazi melodies. And he includes what is probably or arguably the first version of the Kol Nidre. The Kol Nidre that we know today, we know that it was more or less in the same shape that we know it today already in the 18th century, thanks to this uh, manuscript. Uh, many of others of these traditional songs, like parts of Maus Tzur that you know, uh, uh, some uh, traditional Kaddishim for Passover, for Shavuot, were perpetuated in oral tradition. So we have, as, uh, the manuscript give us an evidence of the continuity of Jewish musical memory. This manuscript was not known to anybody except to this cantor, so he also uh, give us now an opportunity to see how much oral tradition was uh, kept. And if oral tradition was kept for the past 250 years, which were a period of such change, we could imagine that also before that some of these melodies were already extant. So that gives us a point, a reference in history where, he, where we can see or actually hear how the Jewish musical tradition was. Besides that, Cantor Bear was a very, how should I put, um, was a real artist. He didn't want the congregation to sing with him. So he wrote for the congregational melodies, he wrote one for each Sabbath. So we have 52 lechadudis of, 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 of bars so that the community, and I put this in his word, okay, was, uh, uh, it, he says, it has become a plague to the Hazan, a plague to the Hazanim to have the members of the congregation join him in song. And therefore, he, but to avoid this, he surprised the congregation all the time with a new song so they, they won't go. Uh, now, what is outstanding in these musical compositions that he, that, that he left us in his uh, 
notebook or his compendium is that besides the traditional melodies, the new melodies that he composed are written in the music of the period. Most of his music resembles the music of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, which was the great composer of Berlin in that period, Bach's song. So it's a sort of classical, early classical style. And sometimes, like this first, uh, um, I think this is one of the, fir the, the first, uh, no, the first piece in the manuscript, in this manuscript, it's uh, 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 Malchutcha, Malchutcha Raoul Banecha. He wrote for one word an entire page of music. Imagine you went to the synagogue, the cantor did an entire sonata uh, for one word. So this is how the Jews of Berlin started to be involved with the classical music of the period via the quotation of these melodies in the uh, synagogue. Let me move into another fascinating uh, story. This is uh, the city of Esslingen. And in the city of Esslingen, there was a cantor called Meyer Levy. And this Meyer Levy uh, was one of the first instructors of Hazanut in a, a formal seminary for training Jewish clergy in Germany. This is part of the intervention of the German state in the life of the Jewish community. They say if the Lutheran cantors are trained in seminars, so be the Jewish cantors should be trained in seminars. So there weren't uh, enough teaching materials. And uh, Moose Ad 26 of the Birman collection, uh, uh, it's the compendium that he wrote for his students. So basically, he explains in German here the entire uh, liturgy, uh, what you have to do. And this is the way he wrote the music. Isn't that interesting? The music is written from right to left. Did you see? Yeah. Here is the code. So you have to read. If you know Ashkenazi liturgy, this is the Kaddish for um, uh, for the high holidays. <laughs> and uh, exactly the same melody sung in traditional Ashkenazi melody uh, uh, synagogues uh, to this uh, uh, day. So uh, the good news is, and I'm proud to announce that the Jewish Music Research Center is releasing this summer the entire liturgy of Meyer Levy of Esslinger on the basis of the Bar Birnbaum collection manuscripts plus additional manuscripts that are located at Gretz College in Philadelphia and an additional volume that remain in Germany, in the, library, in the National Library of Germany they have another volume of the same. How these volumes got separated into three libraries, the librarians will be able to <laughs> tell me. And what we did is we asked a young cantor serving today in Berlin to read some of these pieces so the, our book will come with a website that includes 60 of these early 19th century melodies taken from the manuscript. So if we can play the first example, do you see that little icon there on the side? If not, I will, yeah, just do the, good. It should be volume. No, it's playing, it's playing.
Jeffrey Goldberg, who wrote his dissertation. And this is one of the direct consequences of our visit in 1979, his PhD dissertation based on the Birnbaum uh, collection, News <coughs> Ad 26. Uh, I should mention here Jeffrey's uh, mentor, uh, my dear colleague, Professor Eliau Schleifer, who also has been instrumental in the use of the uh, Birnbaum collection for pedagogical uh, uh, purposes. I would like just to go now a little bit into the Sephardic world. This is more or less more of my own uh, work. Uh, but you already got in the former example what my vision is regarding the Birnbaum collection. This is not something dead. This is not a dead object, a fossil. This is a, can be a living collection at least for reenacting the musical memory of the Jewish people, and sometimes to reenact this music and bring it back to life through performance. This is why, in every occasion that I have, I uh, make a condition to give a lecture. Say, you want me to give a lecture, there should be a concert. And I send them the scores from the collection in order to be performed. And here we have the um, Livorno tradition, Livorno in Italy, one of the most important Spanish-Portuguese communities in uh, Western uh, Europe. Uh, uh, Birnbaum showed a fascination with the other Jewish culture, that of the Sephardi, as did uh, many of his contemporary German Jewish scholars of the Wissenschaft the student of school. Although he did not left an entire study of Sephardic liturgical music, he laid the basis for future research on the subject by minutely studying several musical anthologies of Sephardic music that appeared in the 19th century and were in his possession. Um, one of these anthologies is what you have here, <coughs> Federico Consolo's Libro dei Canti di Israele, The Songs of Israel, uh, published in Livorno in 1892, celebrating 400 years of the uh, expulsion of the Jews from Spain. And uh, Birman wrote, uh, a few months after this book appeared, Birman already had his hands on a copy, and he wrote a very extensive recension of this, uh, uh, of this music. This is the synagogue in Livorno. I show you this magnificent European synagogue in Western Europe that uh, uh, where all this music was being produced to enhance the soundscape of this magnificent building. This is uh, the synagogue uh, in the 1920s, and uh, the synagogue regretfully was bombarded by the US Air Force in World War II by mistake. Uh, Livorno was the main port of fascist Italy, the main military port, 
and the port was bombarded and the synagogue was very close to the port and this is why this is the sanctuary uh, the Arona Kodesh you can see the magnificent art and the display and this place needs a very good choir and a very good composer and that's what they have and uh, this is uh, one of the four major manuscripts of the Birnbaum collection with all the music of Livorno. Birnbaum had connections uh, to Livorno. I don't know how all these manuscripts he could acquire them, but this is a magnificent document um, that um, uh, 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 regard, uh, that were uh, produced by Ernesto Ventura, who was the Kapellmeister, the master of the chapel of the synagogue in Livorno in the early 20th century. Um, what I want to point out here is that the arrow shows that several, many of the pieces were written by uh, different composers, including here you have the Hallel by Mr. Alevi. This is the great composer Alevi from, from Paris that composed also in Hebrew. But the arrow shows that some melodies are called musica antica, that is to say, very old music, we don't know the author, this is the oral tradition. This is the manuscript Musica Sacra di Venezia, the sacred music from the synagogue in Venice, late 19th century. This is the way the manuscript from Venice look at the heart of it. And uh, this is how the... Uh, uh, the uh, Moose um, uh, 7 and 8 looks with the music of this composer, Michele Bolaffi, one of the most important Jewish composers in Italy in the early 19th century. More or less, as you're going to listen, his music sounds like Rossini. <laughs> <laughs> so here what we have is a setting of Bolaffi of a song for the, set, the last day of Passover, Le Shmini Shel Pesach. Uh, and uh, this uh, song, just to show you the changes in musical culture, is written for a choir of three voices. The choir in Livorno was of three voices. It included bass, tenors, and children. <laughs> that was the composition of the choir. And uh, uh, Bolafi wrote new music for this poem, Yarum Ben Issa, which is a 16th century poem, very unknown, that continued to be performed in Livorno with traditional melodies, and he wrote a new setting. But this is the original 16th century uh, uh, text, which I put with the arrows, the original, the, the poet, the great Israel Najara, designed this poem to be performed with a Turkish melody. So what you have here in Hebrew letters is the name of a Turkish <coughs> melody in Hebrew letters, and on the other side, the name of the musical mode, the makam of this, uh, of this uh, piece. Uh, he, we also have uh, uh, in this collection uh, the uh, origins of some of the melodies that are still sung in the synagogue and no one knows where they come from. So now we know this famous Adon Olam, from Paris. So we know the melody came from Paris, but we found in a manuscript from uh, Livorno. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I will just uh, move uh, fast. Um, <coughs> Okay, so let's hear two pieces from this collection. I want you to hear music. I mean, I can talk so long, so much for about all this. Let's play the next bit. This piece is Le Chadodi, uh, from the, uh, the Birnbaum uh, uh, manuscript, and is performed by the cantorial students of the Jewish Theological Seminar in Jerusalem under uh, the direction of my wife, Cantor Marlena Fersman, who is here. They did an entire Shabbat service of Livorno based on the Birnbaum collection. So the students really learn all this music and they perform. This is their Lechadudi. Shabbat <laughs> shalom. 
This is one of the most beautiful pieces from the manuscript. It's the Igdal uh, by uh, Maestro Garcia. Maestro Garcia was a very uh, secondary composer of opera in uh, Italy. Uh, some of his operas were performed in very good theaters, more or less contemporary of Verdi. And uh, uh, he has many musical compositions. He was also Kapellmeister of the synagogue in Livorno after the uh, Bolafi. And in um, the early 2000s, I did a series of lectures at the Ohio State University of Columbus. And they did a huge concert with a choir of 80 singers, multi-American, multicultural American singers, Asian students, Afro-American students, singing Igdal Elohim Chai by Garcia. And uh, I'm very proud of this recording. And here you can really can feel Rossini as it best. So if that, remember, no musical instruments and only three voices. The composer has to be very gifted. You will be surprised if you know, if you ever studied composition, it's easier to read, to write music for four voices than to write for three voices. So they needed to be very skilled to recreate the uh, uh, texture of an entire choir with only three voices. Bebakasha, please. Last two examples. Turkish Jews in Vienna. Okay, so that's my most personal story. This is Mus Ad 25 from my PhD dissertation. So when I was cataloging this manuscript, I saw this piece, Achot Ketana, my little sister, which is a poem that is only performed in Sephardic synagogues in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
It's a poem from Spain from the 14th century, and it's the opening for the Rosh Hashanah services on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, only in the Sephardic communities. What is this doing in the Birnbaum collection? I ask myself. And besides that, you can see this is uh, so the German handwriting of the 19th century, Sephardic, Sephardische original, original uh, melody original Sephardic melody. And when I read this music, because usually when I have music in front of me, I immediately sing it internally to myself. I said, I know this melody from, from the shuls in Jerusalem. So to find in a manuscript this melody here in Cincinnati, in the Birnbaum collection, was really mind-blowing. To make the very long story short, there was a Turkish Jewish community in the city of Vienna from the late 18th century until the 1920s. And this uh, uh, synagogue, uh, which you can see here, was a magnificent construction in the city of Vienna. Now imagine Johannes Brahms, young Mahler, are walking in front of a Turkish synagogue in the middle of Vienna. And inside, they are performing this oriental music. However, what emerged from my work here and from other documents that I found is that the younger generation of Turkish Jews, those born around the 1860s, 70s, were already Viennese Jews. They say this oriental stuff is not good for our ears. Let's hire a real cantor. Okay, they hire an Hungarian cantor and a real choir master, and let's put the same melodies into musical notation and arrange them for choir. And this is how these documents reach the Birnbaum collection. The collection was done in Vienna. Birnbaum asked the cantor in Vienna, okay, uh, cantor, uh, this is the publication of, of uh, parts of this manuscript. He asked these two guys, the cantor, cantor Bauer, and the uh, conductor of the choir, Lowy, to send him this manuscript. And he said, I will copy and I will return from you. I found the postcards between them. He never returned it. <laughs> this is why we have the manuscripts. And good that he Birnbaum used to borrow all these materials, promising that he will copy and return, and he never did. Thanks, God. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, we are going to hear uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, a couple of pieces that are related to this collection. So if you can play the first example, please, I will tell you what it is. <laughs> I apologize that the volume is not as it should be. So this is a cantor, a Turkish cantor in Tel Aviv that we recorded singing the very same melody. He doesn't know this manuscript. So this show you again, again, the tenacity of the Jewish music uh, oral tradition. And the second example is the HUC choir in Jerusalem <laughs> singing Lechadodi from Vienna from the Turkish community, one of the most ancient Lechadodi melodies in existence. Please, the second example.
So that's the way the Lejado de from Vienna sound, sound very European, four voice, harmony, etc. But if I sing it to you, Lejado de Lecrafcalapenes, that sounds a little bit more oriental. So you see how the music was processed and how we have these two products. We have the original manuscript with the almost an ethnographic <coughs> um, um, transcription and the melody itself. And the last chapter is Birnbaum, the Prussian Jewish composer. This is the way that Königsberg looked when Birnbaum was working there. This is the great synagogue of, uh, of uh, Königsberg, it's called the Neue Temple, that is uh, the new temple where uh, Cantor Birnbaum uh, used to uh, proceed. Of course, this magnificent sanctuary was burned in crystal now. And now, and this thank you to uh, Laurel who pointed to me out, the synagogue was reconstructed out of ashes. I mean, in the same location, on the basis of the photographies. There was a big donation, and the Russian government did a big display uh, a couple of months ago uh, in Königsberg, inaugurating. This is the way the synagogue looks today, again. Uh, uh, this is an amazing project, OK? It's a very political issue. I read then, following Laurel, your your note, uh, I read a little bit about this. And you see there is a plaque. Uh, you have the old scene with the new set. The plaque is outside in the street. And I found in the internet, someone wrote, in Kaliningrad, they had on October 16 a ceremony for the reconstruction of the Neuen Synagogue. A placket on the rock is set before the site of the synagogue, but some vandals ruined the placket and placed neo-Nazistic neo stuff on the rock idiots. So they already desecrated the place. It was just open. Kaliningrad is not a good place for Jews today. But they made this amazing synagogue. And you see who spoke at the opening of the synagogue. The chief rabbi of Russia. If Birnbaum will, say, will, will look at this, I think he will faint and run back to his grave again uh, by, by uh, looking at that picture. The, uh, we have uh, this record, which is right here. I, uh, you see, I told you, we got the same. 1984, a landmark recording of Beta Futsot, the Diaspora Museum in Israel, uh, uh, music from Königsberg, much of it uh, 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 by Birnbaum. Uh, and uh, this is one of the first productions that, in a way, is also related to our trip to Cincinnati in 1979 because some of the scores were brought by us from here. Uh, and I want to, this is my last, um, uh, or, uh, yeah, this will be my last musical example. This is the Lejado D by Birnbaum. And Birnbaum published his music in the most bizarre places. So many of his pieces are published like a supplement to a newspaper that has nothing to do with music. <laughs> and this is how this. And uh, I was uh, glad in another uh, concert that I did this time in Toronto, in Beit Sedek, which is great cantor Simon Spiro, a program of synagogue music from German synagogues in the 19th century, mostly based on the Birnbaum collection. So again, you see my efforts to bring this collection back into life. The beautiful Lejado D, this is uh, my own retranscription of what you see here was the original publication. So please, if we can. Uh, play the piece, the icon is up here.
It's one of the most beautiful lejadodis I know. It's very Prussian, it's very dignified. It doesn't run, it doesn't rush. You can hear the text very clearly. It's a beautiful piece of music. Uh, uh, Birnbaum was, unlike what Edelson had to say about him, was a good composer of synagogue music. Uh, just towards the end, Birnbaum was a truly citizen of the German Empire, of the Second Reich. And when the emperor died, Wilhelm I, he was really moved and he wrote this magnificent El Malay Rachamim, one of the most beautiful El Malay Rachamims. Uh, you see the Hebrew and the German translation, Wilhelm Arishon, <laughs> Wilhelm I. Uh, and uh, the music is based, of course, in the traditional El Mare Rahamim for voice and organ, but a very dignified, a very German rendition of El Mare Rahamim. And to end, since Purim is next week, <laughs> I wanted to bring you some Purim, and this is a very interesting uh, story. Uh, Birnbaum used to publish these pamphlets for different occasions, whether for his own lectures or for other occasions. Here you see uh, for the uh, uh, conventions of the Verein für Jüdische Geschichte und Literatur, for the convention of the Association for Jewish History and Literature in Königsberg in the year of 1894. He published Pismon le Purim, that is to say a song for Purim, a surlan le mishtaya maya. It's forbidden to drink water. That's what it means in <laughs> Aramaic. Mi Mit music noten, okay? So um, at the before the music itself that he distributed, he always wrote an is an essay, and these essays are like little pearls of research that he the man knew so much, but he was overwhelmed by his own collection. So he never wrote uh, a, a book except one book on Jewish musicians in the court of the of the Duke of Mantova in the 17th century. All the rest are these little snippets that he took from this archive. So here he explained uh, uh, that the uh, original song, uh, which you have here, was published in 1628 by a cantor from Salonica in Greece that moved to be the first cantor of the Portuguese congregation in Amsterdam. He published a poem with his songs. And this is one of his songs. In the uh, refrain is in Ara Aramaic, but the rest of the stanzas are in Hebrew. And in a way, it's interesting because the stanzas in Hebrew recall very much a song in Ladino, in Judeo-Spanish, that we know to this very day. So since this was a Sephardic <coughs> source, and the Sephardim, as I showed you before with the poem of the 16th century, in many cases they say, please sing this song to the melody of this other song. So here you have uh, what the arrow says, Lachan de Giketa, or de Giketa, uh, that, uh, that the poet intended for his song. So Birman went into an entire, how do you say, speculation about what this means. So I will tell you what it really means. <laughs> it means lachan de chiquita, that is to say, from the little one. And we know this, I wrote a book about Judeo-Spanish songs in Hebrew manuscripts. And this melody was very well known in many communities. The chiquita means, since I was a little girl, okay, you love me. That's the continuation of the song. But Birman Law wrote uh, here this entire essay and he read Lachan di Giketa, and Giketa is a jig, <laughs> you know, a jig, a little jig. And then he says, this little jig, uh, in the whole Sephardic music that I know, I only find this melody in this rhythm of the, of the jig, which is a dance, a Spanish dance, I find it only in the Song of the Sea, the Shirat Ayam, of a source that you can see here is another book here of the Birnbaum collection. This is the 1857 publication of the Spanish Portuguese litur liturgy by Cantor Aguilar and the Sola, Cantors Aguilar and the Sola, the Cantor of the Portuguese synagogue in London. 
So here you have the melody, and Birnbaum took the melody, which is a transposition, and put the words to the melody and make the people in the convention sing this song for Purim. <laughs> now, uh, what is most interesting, I, you always learn from Birnbaum, and I knew this pamphlet because I read it 40 years ago, but now I read it again, and I always learn something new from him. So he writes in the middle, this melody, that is to say the Shira melody, the melody for the song of the sea of the Portuguese Jews, is quoted in a composition by this Danish composer, okay, uh, uh, Ander Amerik in seine Jüdische Trilogie for Orchestra, a, a Jewish trilogy, a symphonic poem, which I didn't know, I confess, I thought, I always think I know already everything, it's a new piece written in the 1880s. You won't believe when this piece were, where this piece was wrote. This piece was wrote in Baltimore. Because this Danish composer came to the United States to be at the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, and that's where he wrote this Jewish piece. I don't know who commissioned this piece, but he's quoting the same melody, okay, in the ending of this uh, um, uh, symphonic poem that he wrote as a song of triumph, uh, uh, um, a march of triumph. So I will end with music as I always end. First of all, on the right, I will just play a few bars of my dear friend, cantor Danny Halfon, who, who was cantor in London, singing the original melody, and then the symphonic poem, and all this is tied by Edward Birnbaum. So, <laughs> let's... <laughs> This is just a snippet of what we have done in the past 40 years to make this music come back on the basis of the Birman collection. My appreciation is that what we have done is a drop in the ocean. So much is left for the coming generations to pursue what we have started in the past 40 years. The collection is here. It will be available as time goes along digital form, which will transform the accessibility to it. And I'm sure that many, many other obscure corners of the Jewish musical culture, as we just heard this symphonic poem, uh, will emerge in the future. And uh, I really hope that the first 40 years it's just the prelude to the coming 400 years 
of the Bear Mount Collection. Thank you very much. Thank you for the beautiful lecture, and we want to invite you to come more here for research. There's a lot to do, and we want to revive all this music, also to perform the music, to, re to continue the music to be live. So we have some, uh, we, have, we have few minutes for questions, so. That's a good question. No, 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 no. That I know, no, that I have done. Can you repeat what? Oh, I'm sorry. The question is if there is a catalog or, or of all the works that that are related to the revival of the music in the collection. And no, uh, basically it's all in my head. <laughs> no. uh, but but I, I and I know there are others. Okay. In the 1998 event in, uh, in New York, there were several performances by cantors from the School of Sacred Music that were assigned to perform. There were a couple of workshops, too. I don't know if everything was recorded. Yeah, the program, but did, did we record something? Yes, yes. OK, OK, OK. So there are some recordings. And uh, then uh, sometimes I have done in my seminars, you know, I just gave the students one of the pieces uh, to, to be performed, but uh, a, a catalog, uh, no. So we, we are also including the future of music that belongs to the Birmingham Collection. So a few years ago, Mark Wigman, that was a professor in New York, recorded music with the students. So we have the music, but we want to continue to perform the yeah. music, not only to have a website with the uh, music, also perform the music. Yeah. So for example, the 60 pieces from the Mayor uh, Levy of Esslinger will be accessible online through the Jewish Music Research Center. And certainly, you will be able to hear that through the HUC um, uh, website, because we are also envisioning through digital platforms, much more collaboration in terms of sound. Because basically, who cares where the file is located? Okay, the issue is if you have access, where you have to, ask it, to, to have it. I don't know how much the National Sound Archive of Israel has of uh, Birman's music. Um, I remember with Eli Schleifer, we did, uh, when we came back from Cincinnati, I gave a, a lecture in my first, I think, I think my first academic lecture was on the Birnbaum Collection, 1980 in Jerusalem. And Professor Schleifer was um, kind enough to perform a couple of, uh, of pieces. I can't remember what he performed. So we, um, we certainly may have more. The National Sound Archive of Israel, 60,000 hours of recording. This is all accessible in digital format. Oh, big chunk of it can be heard online from anywhere in the world. For the rest, you will have to come to Jerusalem to the building of the library because for the reasons of copyrights and many other reasons, the music is accessible in the building. But all our collection, 60,000 hours, is available to the public. And this is amazing too. Tell you, like the musical memory of the Jewish people is alive and on record. And you heard one of these recordings, the Turkish cantor, that's from our archive. The last piece, I didn't catch where it originated from. The Asia Shir Moshe. The Asia Shir Moshe? It's not the Portuguese, I mean, the song is the same melody, it is in London and Yeah, yeah, it's loads, yeah, it's in different variants. Well, let me tell you this. Birman writes about that. <laughs> so he, he says that, and this is true, Cantor Di Sola, who produced this book, in the introduction to the first edition of the melodies, because 
The second edition was published in the 1930s. The community decided to take the amazing introduction that the cantor wrote. He says, literally, this is the melody that the children of Israel sang when they came out from the sea. <laughs> 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 Are you referring to Manginot? To Manginot, a Manginot Atikot. Okay? And I wrote a big article about this. It's called Manginot Atikot. That's the name of my Regretfully, still in a foreign language called Hebrew. And, uh, I really, I'm, my friend requested a, a translation of it once, so I made him a very quick one. Oh, really? Like very quickly. I, I oh, my gosh. I him one very quickly. I have to do, uh, yeah, well. Years ago, but I, I, I remember him. Uh, his name is Elliot uh, Alderman. And he used yeah, to I know. Be, Elliot is. He used to be in London. Elliot is the director of the choir in London. Not, any, no, not, not anymore. anymore. No, no. <laughs> it doesn't matter why, but. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine why. I know <laughs> enough <laughs> where the <laughs> Portuguese <laughs> community is. <laughs> And <laughs> the Portuguese and communities approach I to their cantors and, and, and musicians. Yeah. But okay. Well, we won't go down. This is not there. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. But please send me my own translation. If you have. <laughs> but 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 that's what the Sola writes. And what? But basically, what the Sola is basing himself, and this is interesting, uh, is that he says what I'm saying. It's written also by a 14th century Spanish scholar. And I think that what the Sola is referring is to the uh, Terush to Shirat Ayam by Itzhak Abarbanel. That Abarbanel writes a very obscure piece about the Shira. And uh, until now, some rabbi said, we, we don't know exactly what he's trying to describe there. In my opinion, and I think that's what the Sola had in mind, that he is talking about this melody. But this is another lecture. However, Come back and give it. yeah, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lecture on Shirat Ayam. But, but what the Sol, what uh, Birbaum is saying, this is, you know, it's a fancy story. It has nothing to do. This is a Spanish jig from the 17th century. So his assumption is as wild as the assumption of the Sola that this is the <laughs> melody. But certainly, it's a very ancient melody. It's a very ancient melody maintained not only in the Portuguese communities, but also in Morocco. So that means that also in North Africa, that gives us a certain sense that this melody really goes back, if not to Moses, certainly to the Jews who left Spain in 1492. That's not a wild assumption to make. Well, I think people have to go. <laughs> have to <laughs> I wanted to thank everyone for coming and making this event such a success because it's exceeded our expectations and we're so happy to have you all here for this Delve Lecture. And before you go, I just wanted to acknowledge the many people who helped make this possible. I mean, of course, of course, Professor Sarusi, but in the library staff, almost everyone was involved in technical aspects in the exhibit and with the exhibit. Most especially, I want to recognize Jardana Gertler Jaffe, Hannah Wolfson, and Abigail Katz, who have worked nonstop on the exhibit. But everyone in the library and in other departments um, in our, what is it, outreach and community outreach departments and our maintenance department, everyone worked hard to make this event the success that it obviously is. And we are delighted and we hope that you'll come back for our next Bell Lecture. We don't know the topic yet, <laughs> but it will be sometime next spring, we hope. And stay for a bit, talk to each other, walk around, enjoy some of um, the goodies we have, and come back and use the library. We welcome you with open arms. We would love to have you come and research all of our collections. Use it. Our stacks are open. That's unusual in a library like this. Come, browse the stacks, ask a librarian. We're here to help you. We want to help you. We'll enrich your lives, and you'll enrich ours. So thank you, and good evening. One more thing, one, we're, we're really 
excited about this? Those QR codes, if you use your smart device and take a picture and staff members will help you download whatever software you need, the app on your device, you can listen to the music that you're seeing that it's next to. This is like we just made a giant leap into the 21st century. <laughs> 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 